everyone, Alex at Corum Deo Farm. We are a year three Oklahoma flower farm that sells retail market bouquets from our roadside stand. On our YouTube channel, we like to focus a lot about business and marketing, profitability, efficiency, all of those things that go into flower farming that's not just growing beautiful flowers. And this winter, since we don't actually have beautiful flowers to show you, we've had some wonderful interviews on our channel. I got to speak with Jenny Marks from Trademarks Flower Farm in upstate New York, well, the Finger Lakes region. I got to talk with Lenny Larkin, who just released her book, flower farming for profit. They both focused a lot on building profitable flower farms. They both operate their own profitable six-figure flower farms. Those interviews were wonderfully helpful. I will link them in the description. But as I said, we only sell retail. And so I don't live in the florist world, but I know that wholesale flowers is a huge part of the flower farming industry. And so during our off season here, I thought it was important that we do address and talk about the wholesale world. And so in our interview today, I got to speak with Ellen Frost from Local Color Flowers located in Baltimore, Maryland. Ellen is a longtime florist who only sources local flowers, if you can believe that. I believe her season is like February through November. She takes a couple months off because obviously it's a little hard to to source local flowers in January, but I interviewed her talking all about how to sell to florists. So pause this video, grab a notebook and pencil because if you're planning to sell wholesale, Ellen is gonna walk you through how to do that with excellence. And that means either launching, you know, you have a goal this year of selling to florists or you sell to florists and you want ideas on how to get bigger orders to approach new florists so that you have more sales channels. Ellen has some incredible helpful wisdom and I hope everyone is prepared to listen to that professionalism and someone who really knows what she's talking about and maybe not just general advice that everyone might be sharing on social media, but I think it's the real, true, good information. So I hope you enjoy this video. Let's get going. have Ellen Frost here. I'm going to let her introduce herself and her florist shop and just a little bit about her history. So tell us about all that you do, Ellen, and include why you chose to go all local flowers, because that's the most unique thing about you. Yeah. So my name's Ellen Frost. I'm the owner of Local Color Flowers. We are a floral design studio located in Baltimore, Maryland. We are in, this is our 16th year in business. So we have been um, doing floristry for 16 years. Uh, we do everything that a florist shop does. So we do weddings, events, retail. Um, we do floral design classes. We have other weird things like a book club and um, flower club. So we do all of these things, but we do everything with local flowers. So everything we use come from farms within a hundred miles of Baltimore. Um, and that's year round. Uh, we do have one or two growers that are maybe within 200 miles that we use in the winter um, that are a little further out. But for the majority, 99% of our stuff comes from within 100 miles of Baltimore. And we, when I started the business um, back in 2008, um, I was heavily influenced um, both by Flower Confidential, Amy Stewart's um, uh, book about the global flower industry, and also, um, I had been doing um, flowers on the side, sort of as just a hobby for a while, working on farms, um, meeting flower farmers, working at farmers markets. And um, the more I sort of dabbled in floral design um, it, and learned more about the global industry, uh, a lot through Flower Confidential, um, 
I just thought it was crazy that we were, we, the collective we, the country of the United States, um, were sourcing so many of our flowers from outside of the United States when we had, I could see my own growers, growers that had product available, um, but that couldn't sell it all or didn't have connections to customers. And it just made sense for me to um, be sourcing locally. And I know when we began, people sort of thought that was crazy, um, but we made it work. That's great. So I love with what you saw in your environment and how you thought that could change. I'd love to get your thoughts starting kind of like meta, and then we'll get into practical ways that you think that farmers can really put a dent into the local flowers and providing them for florists, how to do that in the best possible way. But my bigger question is, why do you think that florists default to buying imports and buying buying international flown in flowers versus like you said, you were seeing growers around you with beautiful yeah. product that they had available. Why mm -hmm. do you think that is? Where are those like tension points where they just default to the online order versus yeah. someone near them? I think there's a lot of reasons actually. Um, one is that um, sourcing flowers from a wholesaler means that you basically have any flower available to you at any time throughout the year. There's no like real seasonality, not seasonality, at least how we think of it. There's no re real seasonality. So people can get, I don't know, red roses year round. They can get, you know, um, I don't know, lilies year round. They can get anything they want basically year round and they can easily build a brand and a look and aesthetic around certain flowers that they can get all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one reason. Um, the second reason is the ease of ordering from a wholesaler. So ordering from a wholesaler oftentimes means you're ordering online. You see everything that you have available to you. You know, with a couple clicks of the button, you are paid, you have ordered, you've scheduled your delivery and you're getting delivery and delivery is usually not that expensive. Um, and you are basically shopping at a one shop one spot shop. So you can get everything you need from the wholesaler rather than like what I do, which is shop around to lots of local growers trying to pull together or piece together all of the things that I need for a week or for a, an event or florists can just get everything at one place. And, you know, I mean, frankly, everybody's time is valuable. Time is money in a lot of cases. And so any way that a florist can make their lives easier. Um, and sometimes that means like, you know, shopping online at 11 o'clock at night after their kids go to bed, or, you know, it's waking up at five in the morning and putting an order in. It's not as easy necessarily, or as um, smooth sometimes to order locally. So I think that's another reason. Um, and then the third reason I think is just that um, the majority of florists, and this is just the reality, don't know flower farmers. They don't know where they are. They don't know how to get in touch with them or how to find them. Or um, they just, it, it's like a different world, honestly. Um, and so I think that is a challenge for a lot of florists. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of there's a lot of other reasons, you know, like the majority of the flowers sold in the United States are coming from outside of the United States. So just the plethora of what's available is mostly imported stuff. Right. Um, and flower shops just for the last 50 years, that's how it's been done. Um, right. I think to get into floristry today, um, you know, there is a lot of that. That's just how it's been done mentality. Mm -hmm. And so um, with a lot of, you know, small businesses and buying locally for all kinds of things, not just flowers. Um, it takes, it sometimes takes more effort. Um, it sometimes isn't as fast or easy as, you know, buying from a wholesaler, buying from Amazon, buying from, you know, places like that. Um, sure. so I think that's some of the reason, um, I think there's a probably Do you a lot think, more. Have you noticed, cause you said you've been doing this for 16 years. Have you noticed from the customer standpoint, 
there's an increased interest in being curious about the source of the flowers that are being bought. And there's more of an interest of the local brand that you think you would like to see maybe florists lean into more. We'll talk about yeah. how to make the the tension points of like sale and availability and communication yeah. easier on the florist because that very right. much matters. But from a style, do you see yeah. a trend towards caring about customers yeah. caring about the source or is it still very like this is yeah. just we do carnations and we do red roses and that's what we're doing? <laughs> I think that for us, we're seeing it more, we're seeing more interest, certainly in the wedding um, world, where wedding customers are interested in, you know, having a more sustainable wedding or having a smaller footprint or, um, you know, something like that. Um, I think we, I think there are customers who are trying to seek it out on the retail level, you know, a single order delivery for a birthday or something like that. Um, but I don't think we see it as much in that realm as I think we do in the event realm. Okay. Um, and, you know, our customers are different because we have educated them and sort of trained them to care about local stuff. Um, so they, you know, they are interested in that. Um, and so I guess there is just to say, like, with education, I think people are more interested um, yeah. when they know the issues. But I don't think that it's common knowledge, um, sort of just like what the issues are around, you know, globalization and local versus, you know, shipped in stuff. Right. Now, that makes a lot of sense. I love talking to you about this particularly because it's like I'm representing the farmer side you're re representing the flora side and I know a lot of what I've consumed is just coming from the farmer perspective because they're the ones that know the flowers they know how to grow the snapdragon you know how to design with the snapdragon those are two very different vantage points and so if you're only hearing from farmers on how to grow flowers for florists and sell to florists I think you're missing a big component because there's a whole other business on the other side of the transaction that has its own time and expenses and expectations. And so I wanna go through here a bit of like, if I'm the farmer and I'm approaching you, walking through what you see and the problems that you'd like to see get better so that we can kind of really hack into that that pie, yeah. that pie of money, so to speak, of all the yeah. interests and, and really make a dent. And so let's start yeah. from the almost like the first step how yeah. should a farmer approach a florist? I know that yeah. I know personality comes into it, but if we're just going with like general professionalism, how would you yeah. recommend a farmer introduces themselves to someone they would like to sell to? I think the first step from my perspective is for the farmer to do the homework of learning about the florist before they try to make any introduction. So that could mean, you know, reading their website, going on their social media, follow the, following them on social media, commenting on their stuff on social media, looking at what kinds of work they do, what kind of jobs do they do? Like, are they only funerals? Are they only weddings? Are they only retail? Do they do a mix? Like really getting a sense of who the florist is before you reach out to them because so many times I think there's a disconnect right at the beginning when a farmer will come to us and say, you know, I've got X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, well, there is no world where I would use that. I don't, our work isn't matched up correctly with that. You know, there's, there's a, there, I think there's a little bit of homework to do before the actual, like, let me introduce myself to you. And especially since, like you said, if a florist is going on a going the wholesale import route, they're largely just interacting with a computer. It's add to cart, yeah. it's pay and check out. But when you're buying locally, it is a human you're going to be interacting with, even if it's through email. And so sure. I can see how if a farmer approaches you and it's just kind of like a blast right at the product, you're thinking like, yeah, but like I have to communicate with you. I have to learn about your farm and your growing Absolutely. skill set and your and your communication style. And there's so much more that you're looking at than like I have 
10 bunches of sweet peas. Right. Because it's not an online cart. Right. And I don't even mind that the farmer, I don't mind as much that the farmer is saying right off the bat, I have a product to sell. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously that's, you know, why you're reaching out to me. Um, But I think it's harder when, um, you know, like for instance, if you were a wedding florist and all you did was weddings and, uh, you know, a farmer came and said, you know, I have, um, you know, 500 sunflowers uh, every week because I have succession plants and these sunflowers are the best sunflowers I have ever produced. Will Are you interested in buying them? And a wedding florist might be like, you know what? I don't really use sunflowers for my weddings. Like that's not a flower that we use a lot. Sure. Um, and I think there's then like a little bit of disconnect because the farmer's like, but my product is so good. It's, you know, priced right. It looks great. It's great quality. I'm great. And the florist is like, I, I, that's, I'm sure that's the case. And my, my, you know, have you seen my aesthetic on my Instagram? I don't use yellow. I don't exactly. So doing that little bit of research, I think helps to put the, put everybody sort of one step ahead. Um, so the next thing I would say is, you know, I'm, I love just like an email introduction um, that gives me a bunch of information about you. Like, who are you? Where are you? Um, what are you growing? Uh, what sort of your season like? You know, do you have flowers just in the summer? Are you growing in the winter? You know, like, what's your season like? Mm-hmm. Um, and then some explanation of like, okay, here I have, I send an availability list every week, comes out on Thursday. Here's a sample of it. Here's how you order. Here's how you pay. Here's how I deliver. So that I have, and and it doesn't even necessarily have to be in that first email, but the first time I talk to you, I need to have like a clear understanding of all of those things. So, um, you know, in terms, I know you mentioned like be like professionalism, Like if a farmer is like, oh, I don't have an availability list. I just email when I have things. That is harder for me as a florist because I'm like, well, I don't really know when to expect it. I don't know when to, when to think that you might have things that I might need, you know, like having a regular schedule of sending the availability list, I think is a huge thing for florists because they you know, get into a rhythm. They're ordering on a schedule. You know, every Tuesday I make my order, every Thursday I get my flowers, whatever it is. Um, the other thing is like those things like how do you pay? Like be ready to tell a florist that. When do you deliver? Be ready to tell a florist that. Because those are things that are going to help me decide if this is a good fit for me. If you only deliver on Saturday and I need flowers on Wednesday to get ready for a wedding and my wedding is Saturday, delivering Saturday just won't work for me. So it's like sort of having all of that set up before you approach a florist, be ready to sort of talk through that when you approach. Those are really smart things to include because we did a, I did a marketing video to help those that sell retail, like work on their marketing. Uh That's usually really hard. And the way I phrased it from a customer standpoint is we're trying to reduce the calorie burn that the customer has to expend to purchase the product. And so in the same way, the florist becomes the customer and by presenting them so much of the information at one time, you're reducing the calorie burn that the florist will have to expend. You know, if they need all that information and if that information has to go through eight different email back and forth, that's a huge lift for the florist. And I imagine it's frustrating or it's just wasted time. You know, your time is valuable. And so reducing the calorie burn on the florist by saying like, here I am, and I'm going to try to make it as easy as possible on you to determine if we should move forward. Absolutely. Um, that makes that I makes a lot that, of sense. I think that idea, like for us, because I think it is, you know, like the florist is the customer. I know like sometimes for farmers that like takes an adjustment to think about because you maybe are selling retail to an end user, but the florist really does become your customer. And so you're right in making it as easy as possible for a florist to buy, they're going to be more likely to buy and to buy more if that process is pretty easy. 
when you, so they send you this email, it's professional. It includes a lot of information. You want to move forward with them for you, for your own shop. Do you request a sample? Do you expect a yeah. sample? Do you kind of just go with a smaller order that you pay for to trial? How do you yeah. move to the next step of experiencing if their product is the quality you want? We do all of those things. So usually I will ask to set up some sort of um, either an in-person meeting. And even if that's just like a meet and greet, like I want to meet somebody in person because these relationships, like you said, are not like buying from the wholesaler. This is not, you know, just ordering online. This is a relationship. So what we're entering into is two people, two businesses that have to work hand in hand together. Um, and I always feel like we're on the same team, right? If I succeed, you succeed and vice versa. So I want to know who you are. I want to see you and I want to see your product. So whether that, I, I don't, I don't care if it's a free sample. Like, okay, I know there's a lot of push on like, people to bring free samples. And that's great. I mean, sure, I'll take a free sample, but I'm more likely to just make a small order so that I can see the quality of the flowers. So I can see how do the flowers come? Are they properly harvested? Have they been put in the right buckets? Are the buckets clean? Do they show up on time? You know, all of those things. So I can sort of evaluate, does this make sense for me? That makes sense. Would you Again, probably personality maybe, but do you, would you feel comfortable or uncomfortable with that cold call style, you know, where like some people will say like, put a sample bucket together and just go in and yeah. introduce yourself and drop off the bucket FaceTime. Is that possible? Is that a stress point? Because obviously it's a, it's a surprise on your day. So not yeah. expecting a full meeting, but if a farmer were to do that, maybe what would yeah. you, your recommendation be? So again, it's not the calorie burn right. on the florist. It is a little bit, um, it is a little bit hard, I think, for the florist in that situation. because Only because they're not expecting it. And so like for me, it's only a problem or a challenge because I'm usually like doing something. And right. so in order to like stop what I'm doing, it's not even that I'm like, I mean, I, I'm maybe I don't want to stop what I'm doing, but I also want to give you attention. I want to like, be able to like meet you and look at your flowers and hear your story. Like I, I love that. I want to have time for that. And like just a walk in off the street, there's not always, I'm not always in a position to do that. Um, and so it is a little tricky. We have had, you know, lots of people do that to us. I mean, lots of people just show up and have a bucket and leave a sample. Um, but I would say that that is not my preferred way of, of handling it. You would um, prefer the, the email intro with maybe a line that says, I'd love to drop off a sample yes. bucket. When would be a good time? Yes, absolutely. And then it's not the surprise. That's, that's my ideal situation. Cause right. then I can just say, oh yeah, come, you know, early on Wednesday before we get started. And I have a half hour to chit chat with you and see the product. Um, so I think that for me is more, is, is a preferred, is a preferred method. Um, it just gives me and the florist and the farmer, I think more time to actually connect. And I'm not like, oh my God, I'm doing 10 things. Just leave them over there. And honestly, when that happens, sometimes that bucket, <laughs> what what has happened is either that bucket just gets mixed in with a thousand other buckets and we don't even realize it was a sample or it comes in and we're like, just use it in what we're using right now. And we don't really even evaluate what that. Because it's messing is. up your workflow of that day because you yeah. weren't prepared to deal with right. what all that is. And if it's a sample, you know, the idea around bringing a sample is so that a florist can evaluate, like, how are these flowers? And mm -hmm. so one of the things is that, you know, I always tell farmers, like, make sure you just mention, you know, this is for you to just play with yourself. You know, you, you just use it for yourself and see how you like the stuff. Mm -hmm. So for me, that would mean I would just be like, 
put together like a little arrangement for myself, like for a creative little, you know, test. And then I would like see, okay, let me see how it looks a day later or two days later, because you don't want it just to get mixed in with like all the rest of the stuff you're doing. You really want to evaluate it. I mean, that's the point is to see how the product works, not just how it looks when it comes in, but how, how is the vase life? How is the stem length? How is, you know, all of those things. So I always tell farmers just like, have a little mention in case, especially if you're like going to a big shop where it can just get lost. Just mention like, you know, I'd like to follow up in a few days and see how you liked the product, something like that. So you can just sort of see like, you know, I, I'm happy to get feedback in a few days if you, you know, have a chance to use it. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. So as we're walking through, we've done the professional email, you've, you've experienced the sample properly. You want to move forward and you purchase how do you communicate with your local farmers? And it, do you think that that is kind of the easiest way that florists could communicate with their farmers? Do you have recommendations on kind of the do's and don'ts, again, of the calorie burn? You know, we're not just adding to cart at checkout. No. It's requiring more communication. How do we make that really efficient on the florist side who's trying to make the order yeah, and make the purchase and then keep going with their day. <laughs> yeah, it's very, I think it's very different for florists um, who start sourcing locally, who maybe haven't done it before, because there is just a lot of communication. There is a lot of, it's not like you just put it in the cart and order and that's what you get. Like a lot of times this is like the farmer is out harvesting and Maybe they have more than what they thought they had, or maybe they have less than what they thought, or maybe the color is a little bit different. You know, there's all kinds of things that happen during harvest that um, farmers often communicate to us during that period. Mm -hmm. um, and florists are not used to that. There, there is That does not happen at the wholesale level. Nobody calls you. Nobody texts you. Nobody's sending you pictures of things. Um, in in the world of local stuff, that happens pretty often. Okay. Um, so one thing would be for the farmer in that initial meeting to discuss, here's how I like to communicate with my florists. I will send my availability list by email and you can respond to that, you know, however they want them to respond. You can respond by email or I'm also open to texts. Mm. Okay, great. But I don't want orders through Instagram message because sometimes they get lost there or through Facebook messaging. So I think for the farmer, set out how you want to communicate with the florist and make that really clear to them. Because if you don't, and then all of a sudden, you know, either on, on either side, you start texting them and saying like, oh, I'm in the field. Here's some beautiful thing I think you might like. That's awesome. But the florist might be like, I'm in a meeting. I can't like just respond to text about my order. I just placed an order and think I'm going to get it. Um, but that goes for the florist too, because you might be seeing, maybe you see something on Instagram and you're like, oh, let me Instagram message the farmer. Do you have this? Or can I increase my order by this much? And the farmer's like, I don't look at Instagram like during the day. Like, yeah. I'm not checking that. Um, so I think the farmer really sets the sets the tone, like sets sort of like the standard of how they want to communicate. And then I think the florist sort of gets on board in whatever way that is. Um, I I like more communication with my growers because what it does, I think, is allows me sometimes to get things that are ready that weren't on the availability list or that there's more of that last week when they put the availability list together. So for me, I like that, but I know that there are florists that are like, it's too much. Like it's too, okay. the texting, the messaging, it's too much. Um, so I think figuring out, and part of it is just like, again, this is a relationship. So figuring out florist to florist how that works. Right. Do you have, so assuming it's not for like a wedding or an event that you have a set design and color palette to work in, but 
I know I've looked at your Instagram, for example, and you have market bouquets in your shop. Mm-hmm. You know, they're pre-mades, they're available for pickup. For farmers that you've built a relationship with, a trust with, do yeah. you have the sort of setup where maybe the communication doesn't need to be as much because you trust them to substitute right. something or you're more flexible? And it's like you're that's obviously not going to happen in the beginning, but you kind of yeah. work towards an understanding Absolutely. that swaps can be made or quantities increase because I didn't have enough of this. So I increased the number there and it's, it's almost unspoken in how you work together yeah. or is it still very like precisely ordered? So I would say there it's like in the middle. So okay. there's still always the communication because no florist, even, even me with my best farmer, like the farmer, I, I don't know, like we have lots of farmers we've been working with for over a decade and literally texting and talking to every day. Even they would not um, short my order or increase my order without yeah. letting me know. And they would not send, you know, a different shade of pink, even if it seemed like, you know, I don't know, like Celosia, like every pink looks like, like looks just about the same. They still would say, hey, I don't have, you know, pearl, whatever I have, this other one, is that okay? Always for me, I'm like, yes, everything's fine. Like if you have to decrease, that's fine. If you have to increase, because we have that relationship, but they wouldn't do it. We're not, We they wouldn't do it without saying something. Um, but because we do have a lot of flexibility when we're not doing wedding work for our retail stuff, you know, we're like, oh, if you have to substitute pink tulips for red tulips like I don't generally I don't care like that's not you know we have a lot of flexibility in that way and we try to just let the farmers have that flexibility too like I'm not trying to stress anybody out about you know retail flowers like this is if it was a wedding it would be different just because you know that's a whole different thing but for retail you know we have a lot of flexibility do you have for some of those relationships like that are a decade old, do you have standing orders with them? Can you talk a little bit maybe about the concept of a standing order? How does a florist feel about that? Or like maybe what are the terms that that yeah. can be an option? Because that is on the farmer side, really nice because yeah. it's a sure sale and it's a part of our schedule of harvesting and it can be easier on our end. How would a florist feel comfortable working towards a standing order relationship. Standing orders, I know for farmers are like, you know, the key, the key ingredient Um, because so much of florist work is unpredictable, right? Like just week to week, we might have five weddings. We might have zero weddings. We might have, you know, it's unpredictable. So I understand that the standing order is, is critical sometimes. Um, We have tried. So let me, let me back up. Standing orders happen all the time um, with local growers and florists and with wholesalers and florists. So it's not a new concept or a strange concept. Sure. Um, we have tried standing orders in a couple of different ways. Um, and it has been honestly challenging for us. Um, and I, I can tell you a couple of reasons why. Um, there's one, there's one sort of method that is just like grower's choice. So, you know, I'll take $200 worth of grower's choice. So the whatever mix of good things that you have this week, um, and that works, you know, in a retail situation. That's not working. That's not something like a wedding florist is going to be using. Um, And this goes back again to like even that first step of like know your florist. If you are working with a wedding florist and you're like, do you want growers choice buckets they're like no i i can't use 90 percent of that um so growers choice buckets so we tried that and they were good they were better um we just found that we like honestly we liked having more control over the things that we got because a lot of times we were like i love half of this and the other half, I'm like, 
I don't love it. And I, you know, from the farmer side, I get it. Like you're trying to mix all of those things, like the really popular things and the not that popular things. Is it because when you say you don't like, is it because obviously you're going to be working on your end with a design or a formula? And so you're, it's almost like you're boxed in with what you're getting and having to create something That's from great. it versus mm -hmm. I've pre-thought of what I want and I'm no. requesting it. No, it's not that. It is that when I get a bucket, if I'm like, oh, um, there's two bunches of sea oats. I like sea oats, but I might not want two bunches of it this week. Like now I'm sort of, instead of having zinnias, I have sea oats. So it's objectively and, good quality, but it's absolutely. not what you want to work with. Right. And so, so after a while, we were starting to feel like it, we wanted more control to say like, if we want something like sea oats, we'll order them when we need them. But we don't want them just as like, you know, a part of a mixed bucket every week because we just can't. We don't have a use for them as much. Sure. Um, and so what we were finding is that we were spending money on stuff that we were like, I don't really need this. I don't really need this. I need more of this, but I don't really need this. Would and standing so, orders exist where it became a little more specific than grower's choice, but not as like, yeah. I want a hundred stems of zinnias and a hundred stems of a spike yes. secondary focal. And then it's like, that works great. That is how we have had more success with standing orders. And so um, like the one grower that I'm thinking about that we've done this pretty successfully with. So you can sort of um, give them percentages. So you can say, I, I like my standing order to be 30% focals, 30% filler, 40% foliage, or whatever mix of that you want. So if you're a florist whose aesthetic doesn't use a lot of foliage, like I use a lot of foliage, but some florists don't hardly ever use foliage. So they might be like, I don't need 40% foliage. I could use like 5% foliage, just a little something. So when you can sort of make those adjustments, the other piece of that that the farmer um, sort of put in place was to let the florist say, these are the colors I prefer just because my retail customer's aesthetic is like this. So, you know, I would prefer a mix of cool colors or I would prefer a mix of warm colors or whatever that is. So even though we didn't know exactly what we were getting, we knew the mix and sort of the general color palette. And so that worked great for us. And we have done that many years with that grower. Um, and it does, I think, give them a little bit more flexibility. Um, and something I was just talking, Jenny, my friend Jenny from Love and Fresh Flowers and I were talking the other day about a possible um, a possible idea too of like a bulk bucket that is like something like Sweet William. Um, for like a retail florist, you don't really care what color Sweet William it is. Like whether it's like purple, pink or red, you just need some Sweet William. Yeah. And so maybe for the grower offering something like, you know, a hundred stem bucket that isn't bunched in the normal way of a 10 stem, you know, sales bunch. It's just like a hundred, a hundred stems in a bucket, mixed color, whatever it is. Maybe that allows the grower to have a little less um, labor, you know, cause they don't have to count. They don't have to bunch it. They don't have to, you know, do that. And maybe they can, reduce the price a little bit for the florist so that it's a win-win. Like we're always trying to find like, what's the scenario where both sides feel like they are getting what they need. So the right. farmer is getting the price they need, florist is getting the price they need, like, or whatever that is. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Cause that would definitely increase efficiency on our yeah. side than mm -hmm. when it gets like a very specific order of colors. Yeah bunches and stuff. I think there's more opportunity for that to be offered to florists. I don't see it being offered that much or at all from some farmers. 
Um, and I think there's more opportunity. I think more florists would take people up on that, especially retail florists. That's a great question. Cause I've been assuming a bit, you know, you're starting a relationship with a florist, but if you already have a standing relationship, you're a couple years into selling them. Would you suggest in a, in a professional organized way, presenting them with that option, you know, yes. as we head into the spring being like, I notice you use our flowers primarily for retail. What mm -hmm. if we, you know, and so you're acknowledging, you know, what they're using your flowers for and offering a solution that benefits both because they might not have thought yeah. of it. Like you said, you were just yeah. brainstorming with Jenny Love yeah. and that was an idea you came up with. You I can think it's that. great. And I think one thing I would say, you know, because we, because it's, it's the time of year of meetings, um, you know, when a farmer and a florist are in a relationship, you know, oftentimes it's a seasonal, it feels seasonal. You know, you start in the late spring and it sort of ends, you know, in the late fall. And then you've got a bunch of time off. And I always suggest that a farmer, I mean, take, farmer can take the lead um, to try to set up a meeting with all of their florists during the off season to say, let's just, even if it's on Zoom or if it's in person, whatever it is, like, let's just have coffee and talk about like what worked last year, what didn't work, what can we improve in for both, for both people. Um, and then talk about like what we always, like, I just had one this morning, actually. Um, we talked a lot about like, oh, I saw that you never order this from me. Um, like, is there some reason you don't ever order this from me? Um, or I see that you're ordering a ton of this and I can never meet your demand for this. Should I be growing more of it? So some way that you are sort of in the off season planning together a little bit. Um, and that would be a great time to say from the floor side, like one of the things I have been saying recently is we are seeing tons of premium blooms coming from farmers and not as much of the sort of filler um, stuff like Sweet William. And that's partially because I think, you know, the the the, the sexiness of focal flowers is just, everybody gets sucked into it. I mean, I, I do too, but I also know like for just like um, financially for profitability, we need some flowers that are filler flowers. And if we had growers that were growing more of them, or if in this case, somebody said, oh, well, I could, reduce the price on that sweet William a little bit for you if I didn't have to bunch it in the same way. So even if it's 10 cents, like that's still for the florist, what it says to me is like, oh, you see like that pain point I have, you're trying to address it and vice versa. I could say, you know, it's okay if you come deliver earlier, if you have to, like, you know, I'm trying to make things easier for both of us. Sure. What would your advice be? I know that in the bigger sense, we all want farms to succeed domestically in increasing more flowers. But at the same time, you are trying to sell as much as you can for your own farm to be profitable. And if you see a florist, for example, that is purchasing smaller orders, say with like five or six people around you, and you know that you have the volume capacity to meet what they're clearly purchasing, Maybe yeah. what would tactically be a way to figure out how you could get that florist to make larger orders with yes. you? How how would that really conversation go? It's such a good question, and it happens all the time. Um, like we are often, I mean, always buying from lots of growers at once, and that's for lots of reasons. That may be because say like one of our main growers um they either don't grow something that we love using so sunflowers is an example we had a grower who was like one of our main growers she just did not want to grow sunflowers that was just not something that she wanted to grow and that was fine however we wanted sunflowers and we used a lot of them in our sort of retail work and so i went and had to find somebody else for sunflowers and what that did was then say okay well I'm getting sunflowers from Farmer B. She also has Celosia and it's a little bit cheaper than Farmer A. So now I might be getting, you know, two things from Farmer B where Farmer A is like, wait, wait, don't, you know, don't leave me for that, for this other thing. So I think there is an opportunity for it 
in the winter meeting or even just throughout the season um, for a farmer to say, one, just make it known. I would love to sell you more. I would love to, to be a more sort of impactful grower for you. So that just lets the farm, the florist know, okay, this person's motivated. They, you know, want to be selling us more. So, okay, let's think of what that means. So maybe that means, you know, growing different varieties. Maybe that means growing larger quantities of some varieties. Um, maybe that means, um, growing a different variety of something like we had this just in the meeting I had this morning with a grower um she said she had a lot of cabbage in the fall but a lot of it was um like the lacy frilled one you know instead of like the round floret ones and you know for me I just said like for our use we are not using a lot of that product like the frilly one our customers don't really like it it sort of blends in in bouquets, it's not as impactful. It's expensive and it's not as impactful. So if you grew more of the round ones, you know, the, the rosette ones, we would buy more of those in that case. So just like, you know, just that communication, the farmer might be like, I don't know why this person will not buy these cabbage. I have tons of them. They're great. You know, whatever. It just may be having that, that conversation needs to happen. Yeah. It, enlightens you and you're like oh that makes total sense like I understand now so I think just showing interest in having more of an impact and maybe just being willing to hear out what a florist has to say if they're like I love I don't know scoop scabiosa and I buy a ton of it from somebody else and if you had it I would buy it from you then you're like okay well now I have a decision point myself do I grow scoop scabiosa or not you know like they can decide then um but if you don't have that conversation i feel like a lot of it is just unsaid and you're like mm, i don't know why i can't I like them that idea of being proactive because observationally since i haven't experienced this but observationally from my vantage point i see a lot of farmers selling wholesale being very like they put their hands out and they're like here's what i have and hope and wait for an order. And that's kind of the extent of the effort. And maybe it's because they they don't want to feel salesy and that's why they don't want to sell retail. So they think going to wholesale, they can avoid it. Whereas what I'm hearing from you and probably what I would do is to be proactive and sell yourself yeah. and say like, I want to sell more to you. Do we need two delivery days a week Yes. And I'm going to one person. Yes. So that is a huge to thing. proactively. Huge. 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 It makes we will more buy sense. more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So have the conversation and to I, be proactive. Yeah. And I think, you know, don't be afraid to say, like, we have, you know, florists buy with their eyes and their hearts. They are not always good at buying within their budget, honestly. And so, if you say, if you send a florist, a, you know, if you're, if you have that kind of relationship and you can either text or send a message, like we have a grower who has like a, I don't know what they call it, like a close friends Instagram group for her, for, for her florists. So when she's in the field, she can post a picture and say like, this looks so great. I didn't know it was going to look this good this week, but it's ready and it's beautiful. And I didn't have it on the availability list and it looks awesome. Mm -hmm. And you will have that scooped up in a second. But if you are feeling like, oh, I don't want to be salesy and I don't want to be pushy and I don't want to share this, then they're not going to know. But building that relationship where you can be like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. I have it available. I, you know, I people scoop that up in a second. Did you hear that everyone? You don't get to escape being salesy if you go the wholesale route. So just accept it. You only have to be salesy to a couple people, not hundreds of people, but you still have to do it. You're still trying to sell a product. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. So in our journey here, now that, you know, we keep walking through and now you're at the point where you've made the order and you're receiving the flowers. Can you tell us just generally, how do you expect to receive your flowers? What is the quality, the condition they arrive in? What do you want for your business? So just like logistically, 
I want people to be on time for their delivery. And that could be um, something you work out with the florist. So it could be an, an hour window. I'm going to come between nine and 10 and you both agree on that. Um, but because our shop and a lot of like small shops, wedding shops, we're not like a retail shop where somebody's just sitting in there eight hours a day. So if you're four hours late, that means I already went home or I went to do another job. And so I can't accept those flowers. So to me, like one of the biggest things is like being on time. Um, then, you know, I want to, I want to not worry about, uh, post-harvest care. I want to know that your post-harvest, um, procedures are, you know what you're doing. You have read the post-harvest ASCFG book, you've gone to, you know, whatever you got to do to, to understand post-harvest care. I don't want, you know, to buy a thousand tulips. And when they get to me, they're all totally blown open because you didn't know what post-harvest care was. That's a good and, a follow up question that really fast is a tulip example. You know, we're supposed to harvest at the color crack stage and we deliver to you from a florist standpoint. Let's say you're ordering tulips and you're going to use them for a Friday event or something. Is it on the florist to get the flower to the maturity stage they want to design with? Or is how does right. that work? This for is the a that constant, constant tension. Okay. Um, this goes back to good communication between the farmer and the florist. So I think that the best way is that on the availability list, a farmer says, I harvest at the color crack stage. Mm -hmm. So the florist knows, okay, when it, well, two things, the florist then knows, okay, it's coming to me. It's going to take four days, five days to open and be ready. So I need to plan my ordering uh, appropriately. The other thing is that a that the farmer, we have farmers that have like on there when you order, like I could put a note. Um, I want to use this on Friday for an event. Could you harvest a little more open than normal? Yeah. So that it is, we both understand. I know that color crack stage is the norm. And I also know that for an event, I might have a different situation. Yeah. So for retail, I'm always thinking base life, proper, you know, harvesting. If I have an event tomorrow and you're like, oh, I happen to have a hundred ranunculus that are totally open. I might be like, great, I can use them. That's exactly what I need. So, so unless it's pre-agreed upon, you expect flowers to receive, to receive flowers at the, the youngest maturity stage that they can be harvested. Proper harvest stage, okay. yes. Got it. So that I think is a big one. Um, having, you know, just very simple, like having clean buckets, having flowers in buckets that are appropriately sized. So you don't have short things in huge buckets. You don't have huge things in short buckets. You're not putting flowers, you know, not packing flowers so tightly that every head of the marigold is broken touches the outside rim of the bucket. Right. Um, so those kind of things. Um, there is a little bit of um, uniformity that I'm looking for. We have had growers in the past that either didn't know or didn't weren't as concerned about sending, you know, tulips are an example again. So sending a 10 stem bunch of tulips, three of them are 18 inches, four of them are 12 inches and three of them are eight inches in the same bunch. Yeah. Not it to be standardized. Has to be standardized. I mean, it just, you could grade, that's a whole nother thing. You could grade things, different prices for different quality. But if you're selling a normal bunch of stuff, it's got to be pretty uniform. Right. Um, and then- I've heard advice said that, you know, one- one opinion is that florists expect absolutely perfect flowers with the longest stem possible. And then sometimes you hear advice from growers that are like, well, no, imperfections are fine. Would you say, again, that comes down to 
communication and expectation. Like a wedding work designer is going to require an imp- like a perfect white tulip, whereas a retail florist might be okay with some wiggle room. Or do you disagree with that? And it should be the top quality going to florists from the field. I am like really big on quality. I think that quality is, I think you can't get away from it. And I think it is a trait that sets farmers apart. They can set themselves apart in a crowded marketplace with high quality stuff. Because for the florist, high quality, even for retail, is just like almost at the top of our of our things to consider. And that's because we have to sell it to an end user. If that if that, uh, I don't know, dahlia has, uh, or sunflower has one petal missing, that's like almost perfect, but it's not perfect. And it actually is something that we ourselves would feel like not comfortable selling. So that means that that's a loss for us. Mm-hmm. So I think that farmers have to really um really have to embrace quality for florist sales. I, I think if you want to, if you want to have like, like I said, you could grade. So you could say like, we have a grower who sells snapdragons. He sells uh, grade A, tall and straight for one price. Grade B, short and straight for one price. Grade C for another price, short and crooked. So that gives me some control over, well, I don't care. I can use crooked. Some floors might be like, I am not using a crooked Snapdragon. Like that might be an opportunity if a grower has a you know wide range of quality stuff, grade it different. Sure. Um, but don't try to sell, you know, sort of mixed quality stuff for your premium price. And the honesty, yeah. integrity on the floor on the farmer side, knowing that florists know flowers from a design and how they operate once you receive them but they might not necessarily know the grow conditions and just i think maybe the the ethical honesty to be like a first flush lizian lizianthus stem is Mm -hmm. a completely different product than second flush six inches shorter they're different and it doesn't just get to be lizianthus bunch and yes it's more labor but that's a quality and a, a professionalism. Yeah. Second flushes of stuff is a huge issue where we do not see enough farmers adjusting their price for reduced quality. And reduced quality could just mean shorter. Um, you know, campanula is an example. You know, you cut your first campanula, it's like, three feet tall and you get like 10 cuts off of it. By the time you're done with the season, you're selling a single side shoot for the same price. And the florist is like, wait, wait, I was expecting because for the last four weeks, I've been getting this kind of product. Now you switch to selling me a single side shoot at the same price. Right. Um, And the response to that, that you're sharing is not don't try to sell it it's being no. honest and offering the communication and description of the product and a price that reflects what it really is and then the florist might still be able to use i mean there's uses for short tulips there's uses Absolutely. for second flush but not Absolutely. the cost of the first yeah. flush lizzie <laughs> absolutely yeah he can often i mean a lot of florists especially wedding florists you might be like i've got to make a hundred faces i will take all of the short things I want to be offered a short thing at a short thing price. I don't want to be offered a short thing at the price of a two foot tall thing. Exactly. Um, so okay. I think I think they have to like really stick with quality. Um, I think it will set them apart, and I think it is something that florists just continue to to search out. Awesome, that's helpful. My last group of questions is more about your design work and what you're seeing in the floral industry, and I'd love to talk a little bit about. You know, Pantone does its color of the year and you might know maybe trends that you see and stuff. And while direct communication with your florist of what they want is the priority, but are you seeing anything maybe coming into this year or future years of trends that are increasing styles that maybe florists are starting to drop that 
would be yeah. interesting for growers to know as they think about crop plans and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, for sure, um, like Pantone, right, is really a thing. And yeah. it really is impactful, especially for weddings. Um, you yeah. start to see, and for us, like in Baltimore, we are probably, it probably takes about 18 months for us to start to see that change. And so if you're maybe in like New York or LA or a place where, you know, those trends can sort of move quickly, more quickly, um, in Baltimore, it takes us probably a year to 18 months to start to see bridesmaids dresses in those colors, linens in those colors, you know, that sort of thing. So, I mean, in one way, it's good because it gives us a little bit more time, gives the farmers a little bit more time to sort of catch up on a new color. Um, but certainly, yeah, I mean, this was peach fuzz, uh, warm, lots of interest in warm colors, um, both, you know, sort of punchier, fruitier warm colors and, you know, that sort of um, dustier. I mean, anything that's called antiqued, anything that is, you know, we were just looking today with the girl that I had at the meeting with this morning, showing me the pictures of some new, you know, vintage stock or vintage antique stock, you know, some colors, sure. all of those muddy, anything muddy um, in terms of flower colors, I think people are just loving. Um, there are, I think still people are really just um, interested in like unique varieties. I mean, at least our customers we're seeing. So people are always searching out just like things that are new and unique. Like we had that, um, that Lysianthus, that Chateau Blue last summer mm -hmm. and um, people went crazy for it. It's like, you know, it's basically like gray. I mean, it's like the weirdest color. It's like purpley gray. And I think people are just like so excited, like yeah. to see something new that they hadn't seen before. Um, so that's always, I think, of interest to people. But for weddings, I think we're just still seeing like lots of warm, um, lots of punchy color. Um, we don't, and partly that's our like our customers and our aesthetic together. Um, you know, we're not doing like a lot of like white rose, pink peony kind of weddings, um, mostly because we don't have that available to us most of the year. Um, so right. yeah. Um, what flower do you buy the most of? Um, probably tulips because they are available the longest. So we start getting tulips, um, locally mid December and then we stop getting them like maybe the last week of April. So we just have like the longest amount of time to get them. Um, so we do buy a ton of tulips. Also tulips are my favorite flower. So I also feel like I'm maybe partial to buying more tulips than I you just want them more. <laughs> I just want them more. Are there any flowers that local growers grow or offer you and you've just decided like that flower is not for me? I don't like working with it or I just don't. It's just not good. Drop it. Not interested. Yes. Um, this I feel like this is under the unpopular opinion section of the discussion. I think I know um, what you're about to say. <laughs> All right. These are things that I personally do not like working with, but other, but our customers like, and so I continue to buy them. Um, I don't love eucalyptus. I don't love working with it. I don't love, I don't love it. Everybody loves it. Um, just like personally, that is a, a product that is hard for me. The scent is hard for me, especially like the blue boy or the baby blue, whatever is like the really sticky, very fragrant, mm. um, more traditional, you know, see it at Trader Joe's kind of eucalyptus. Um, don't love it. Uh, what else? I'm going to think there are honestly, there's not a lot calendula. I don't really use calendula. I don't, it's too weird. I mean, actually that goes to like Nicotiana too. Like that sticky stem is yeah. like not a I don't love, I don't love a sticky stem. Is um, there a flower that you know when you're ordering is a little bit of a gamble because of its fussiness and you know it and accept it because you want the flower, but it's, it's a stress flower for yes. you when you purchase it. Tweedia, um, 
lube, what do they call them? Forget me nots. Yeah. Um, hibiscus mahogany splendor. Um, <laughs> right. I mean, it's like every year I buy it and I'm like, please, this will be the year. And these are, you know, it's it's coming from farmers who know what they're doing. It just is a very touchy product. Um, those are a couple that I'm always like, ooh, I'm going to order it, but I don't know. Yeah. All right here at the end, I want to talk about what you're working on in your content creation, because it's clear that you have just so much knowledge in both through experience and then teaching it. And so the first thing I want to mention is you have a workshop through the Gardener's Workshop called Selling to Florists. And it's basically yeah. this video times 100, where all of these topics are covered, but in much more depth. And you kind of walk through the process of like, this is how to put together an availability list. Let's talk about pricing. Let's talk about truly how should the flowers look at delivery, those yeah. sorts of things that if you want to sell to wholesale or you want to increase your orders and do better with your florists, I think this workshop is just such a valuable purchase and use in your education from the grower side. What what do you have to say about the the workshop? That yeah, so the um, preparing to sell the florist class is a short class. It is very succinct. Like I, we were very careful to um, user friendly and literally like do these 50 things and you will be, you know, on your way. Awesome. Um, and we've had great feedback. Um, I actually had, um, met with a grower from Massachusetts that I had never met before. We happen to be in the same place at the same time. And he said, he took that class and he said, I did the things that you said to do. I did every step you said, even the ones that I thought, oh, I don't know. Um, and he said within like shortly after taking the class, he said, I got my first three florists that I was working with. So it was, you know, it really is, I think, like a step by step kind of, you know, prepare yourself. And it it's really um, confidence building, I think, because it really makes people feel like, OK, I have done all the things I have prepared myself. I'm not just walking in cold. I'm not just walking in unprepared. I'm not going to feel bad if a florist rejects me. I'm going to, I tell you what to do if a florist rejects you. Like, yeah. they, like you feel confident, I think, after taking that class. And um, it's so, I mean, it's like I said, it's like two hours and it's really inexpensive. It's like 50 bucks. Yeah. I mean, so if you, if you're going to sell a florist and you don't watch this ahead yeah. of time, negligent. <laughs> I think it's a, I think it's a good one. And I'm, I am biased, but I think it is good. Well, I have friends that sell wholesale and they bought the class and they told me, and when I was interviewing you, they're like, well, her modules are great. And she goes over uh, this. And so I've heard great so nice. in my world. But another thing that you have going on is a YouTube channel. And so I subscribed to it. I watched your video from today and it was wrapping a market bouquet. And if you sell retail, so not just wholesale, but if you tell retail and you are putting together like a CSA bouquet or a higher end bouquet that includes a design element and is not just like a grocery store production line. It's a fantastic 10 minute video showing how you prepare the stems, how you lay them out. I think even down to the technical, how you're holding the stems in your hand and, and turning as you design is really helpful to see visually. Yeah. And so your videos are great. They're, they add a design element. And so if you are a farmer florist and you're trying to up what you're doing or you just want to know how like okay i sell retail but i have all these flowers and i'd like to be able to make a better arrangement for my yeah. dining room table with my flowers you have some really great like how to's there's also some growing help of how to grow you know peonies and work with them yeah. that sort of stuff so i'll put all these links in the description but i think your yeah. channel is really helpful on the how to standpoint Thank of you. growing your skill sets as a grower and yeah, we've been working like really um, just over the past year, I think, trying to expand um, sort of like the education piece of our work. And so, you know, that's sort of two pieces, like we have a weekly newsletter um, that 
you know, sort of talks about all of the things about flowers that we love growing, designing, um, flower adventures, you know, sort of flowers in the world. I think it's appealing to a wide range of people. And then sort of the the hand in hand piece of that then is the YouTube channel. Um, so it is really new to us. Um, we're also like, you know, I'm 51 years old and trying to start a YouTube channel. Um, so it's also just like feels like very different than just, you know, the muscle memory of going in and making a bouquet. Yeah. Um, Slowing but, it down probably took some thought because you're probably yeah. just so oh yeah pilot almost with it. <laughs> yeah, but it's been really fun. We do I do a lot of education in person, like mm -hmm. in my um, shop and, you know, sort of out in the world. Um, so it's been fun both for the weekly newsletter and for the YouTube channel to be able to be doing education a little bit differently. Um, it's been a challenge and just, yeah, really fun and being fun, being able to reach sort of people outside. Our business has always been very hyper local, very hyper local. Um, and so it's been really fun to just be able to sort of connect with people outside of our, our Baltimore community. I bet that's helpful. And I'll put your Instagram links below, but you have the one that's with your name, but then you also have local color flowers with yeah. just lots of content that's not just for your customers. I know a lot on the local color flower side, you post a lot of just great articles and stuff talking about mm -hmm. the domestic cut flower industry and just those kind of conversations, yeah. like you said, with the education element. And it can be helpful even if you sell retail to learn about these sort of things. And then you can, in yeah. your own words, educate your customers in a tactful way of why supporting you either through retail or through florists that you sell to is really important, you know, for the domestic yeah. flower industry. So I really yeah. enjoy your Instagram from an educational yeah. standpoint. So, Thank you. So one thing we do at the end of our videos for those that are like the committed ones that watch the whole way through because they want to learn it. is we put a secret word at the end and so <laughs> they put it in the comments and stuff because it's like we watched all the way through and so when I had Lenny Larkin on and stuff she picked data because she's like <laughs> the spreadsheet nerd and we yes. had some other fun ones and so I wanted to let oh. you I will say though our last video I chose frost with a snowflake ah. as it's easier to have you on so you can't pick frost but can you give us like a secret word it helps if there's an emoji kind of for it but Maybe something that like you think of like a favorite flower even, or. I guess I would have to go with tulip then because there is an emoji for a tulip. Like, there is. And we're almost in tulip season. I know you open for Valentine's day with yes. your tulip. So that's a really, yep. that's a really yep, good, that's one. A good one. Yeah. Well, thank you for talking with us. There's so much wisdom here. I hope those of you that are planning to sell wholesale this year, just feel really equipped to do it with professionality and with excellence. Yeah. And that sort of approach to your business is only going to increase your sales and make your farm profitable. And so take Absolutely. these, take this advice, apply it, go follow Ellen, subscribe, seriously sign up for that workshop. I mean, $50 to know exactly what you should yeah. do when you talk to a florist is like a no brainer. I mean, that's a McDonald's meal for my family at this point. So, <laughs> yeah. so exactly. I think it's totally worth it. So those links are in the description and thank you, Ellen, for giving us all your wisdom. And time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Awesome.